So thank you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to answer some questions for us. Um, if you wouldn't mind just giving a brief introduction. Brief introduction. Well, uh, I am Phil Hampton. I am an adjunct professor at Howard Law School. I teach the trademark class in the fall. Uh, my day job is as a senior partner and the chief diversity and inclusion officer at Polsonelli. Um, I've been doing IP work for 40 years. And because of my own situation, I've had to deal with diversity and inclusion in law, in big law for all 40 of those years. So at this point, I'm beginning to merge everything together. Thank you for that. And just to get started, um, how did you make the decision to go to law school? And you probably don't want to hear the answer because it's not the, it's not a correct answer. Uh, I was working as a summer engineer for Exxon Chemical in Baytown, Texas. And I realized that, you know, a chemical engineering job, the good chemical engineering jobs, A, were in godforsaken places, at least for black people, because no one wants a chemical plant in their backyard. So they're generally in places where they're not many of us. Moreover, um, you know, as a junior engineer, you were often responsible for making sure that everything in the plant ran efficiently, which included, you know, climbing up large towers and reaching over vats of acid to see why some affluent wasn't coming out of some pipe somewhere. And I was like, nah, that's, I don't want to do this. And it was, and I don't know what, I cannot remember what happened on the exact day, but I remember I took a half a day off, drove into Houston and filled out my uh, law school application, filled out my LSAT um, application in the Dean's office at the University of Houston Law School, because I realized that day that I could not be an engineer in my entire life. It's an interesting story, not the typical path either. Um, and so what do you know now that you wish you knew in law school? Well, coming out of engineering, I didn't know what I didn't know in law school, which was difficult. I really did not take the time and the care to really, you know, um, study cases the way I should have. Uh, I guess my problem was coming out of engineering, I was looking for a a, a short, simple answer. And only after I got into law school did I realize that a big part of the law is being able to, to spot issues, even if you didn't think they were the most important of the issues. Whereas in engineering, you know, I, you know, you were looking for a right answer, which is why contrary to a lot of people, I spent, I, I don't think I spent one night all night in law school but I had spent many nights all night in engineering school. But now if I had to do again, I would have taken law school a little bit more seriously. Not so much seriously, but I would have uh, worked differently in law school and analyzed things differently uh, in law school. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. Of um, and kind of going off of that, what skills or qualities have helped you to rise to your current position? Well, again, you know, this is not another uh, not so good answer. I, uh, I would say the two things that have kept me going and allowed me to, to navigate through big law in particular has been perseverance and stubbornness. And I say stubbornness because the way I was treated when I first started practicing law as the only person of color at my law firm and one of only a handful of black IP attorneys in big law in the United States, um, I probably should have quit the profession. I just should have. I mean, it, you know, I, I wasn't getting on certain cases. I mean, even the fact of me doing trademark work was because, and it was at least partially because the firm I was with, some of the white male partners thought that patent litigation work was too hard for black folks and women. Because there was a woman in my class who was actually a member of the patent bar and had a chemistry degree from Harvard. 
and she did all trademark work. And I did about 50% trademark work myself because they thought that, you know, that, that was a little bit hard for, for people of color and for women to do I, uh, patent litigation. But I, I decided to turn lemonade, lemons into lemonade, learn trademarks very well, and the rest is kind of like history, right? Uh, and perseverance, you have to s stick at it. Um, I think a, a lot of times people will, will, will allow you know, certain things to defer them from their dream. If your dream is to become the best in, in a profession that you want, to, you want to become the best in, you have to be willing to stick to it. A lot of people are going to tell you what you can't do, but you have to have enough confidence in yourself that you can do it. And I think the, my, my perseverance and my outright stubbornness to be deflected, um, Reginald Lewis, who the, the uh, museum in Baltimore is named for, uh, he, he had a great line. He, his, book, his book title was, White Guys Shouldn't Have All the Fun. I played on that a little bit and said that, you know, white, you know, white guys need to feel my discomfort too. And I understood that my being in the room sometime, in the, in the, particularly in the 80s, caused some of them a little bit of discomfort. So they knew how I was feeling. So again, it's just stubbornness that, that really helped me get through it. Yeah. I feel like as a young professional going into the field, that's not something that I may face to that degree, but that's definitely something that is in the back of my mind, thinking about making um, people where I'm going to work uncomfortable, not used to having someone that looks like me in their space. So I think that's a really um, important, but also relevant perspective even today. Um, yeah, even today it is because, you know, a lot of folks, they, they may consider themselves very progressive, but they have never had to deal with a person of color and particularly a black woman on their level on their level or, or someone who's striving to become on their level. It's a lot different when you're the only black folks that you, you have to be nice to are, are, are your, your, your kids' nannies or, or, or the Uber driver or whatever. It's a lot different when you have to deal with someone who is your educational and um, you know, academic equal. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and that kind of answered my next question, which are what challenges have you faced in your legal career? But are there any other challenges outside of um, being the only person of color in rooms that you faced? Um, or is that kind of like the major challenge that you encountered? That may have been a major challenge, but there are other, there, there, I mean, just the practice of law, there, there are challenges. I mean, you know, you know, race and gender aside, you know, all, lawyers all have big egos and having to deal with big egos in the room is often an interesting uh, situation. And, you know, everybody thinks they're, they're smarter than you. So you have to deal with that. And as a young lawyer, it becomes difficult when you have three, three partners, or three bosses, and they have differing ideas and you're supposed to come up with the draft that incorporates all their differing ideas. So there, there, there are some challenges like that, um, you, you know, and looking back on it, there, some of it were, ended up being very fun, fun stories to tell over a few drinks. But, um, you know, the, but it, it's really just the, the whole practice of law, the whole way the legal system is set up and who, be, who wants to become a lawyer and how lawyers get ahead in law firms. I mean, you know, a lot of places, there's a lot of competition among lawyers in the same class. And, and that, that causes just its own uh, set of problems. And, and then you top it off being a diverse person anyway. And then it, it just, sometimes those problems just magnify themselves. Uh, but hopefully um, a lot of those issues you guys don't have to face anymore. Um, there will be the one one offs and two offs that you'll have to deal with, but hopefully it won't be a a day to day thing, you know, where your work's not getting done because you're the person of color and, you know, 
they claim that everybody else's work was there before yours, et cetera, et cetera, and you know things like that. Yeah. Well, kind of switching gears a little bit, um, can you compare your experience working at the USPTO and working at firms? Uh, it, there's really no comparison because remember at the USPTO, I hate to put it this way, but it's true. I, I, I was the king. It's always good to be the king. I, I, I was the head of the trademark office and it allowed me to do things uh, as long as I stayed with in the law and didn't get too obvious about certain things, I was able to make some changes that I, you know, it would be difficult to make in a law firm unilaterally. Um, you know, for example, we substantially increased the number of African American lawyers. Um, and I did it in a way which was, was perfectly legal, but not too many uh, folks had thought of. And that was instead of me going out and hiring folks and maybe possibly subjecting myself to a claim of reverse discrimination, I put it on the people hiring the attorneys. I made it a, a part of their performance plan, a diversity element in their performance plan. And if they, you know, and you know, a couple of people tried to challenge me, what is diversity? And I, used um, one of our Supreme Court justices, it may, it, it, you know, it may have been Thurgood Marshall, who, who about, no, it wasn't Thurgood Marshall, it, but it was the quote about pornography. You know, you know you, it's hard to define, but we all know it when we see it. And that, that's what I told people diversity was. It's hard to define, but we all know it when we see it. And, um, and because, you know, if they did not uh, get a good grade on their diversity element of their performance plan, they wouldn't get a bonus. All of a sudden, folks who had never hired an African-American or Hispanic lawyer suddenly started hiring African-American and Hispanic lawyers. In fact, um, we hired so many folks, they hired so many folks, because I made sure my name wasn't on any hiring document that yes, the um, Inspector General of the Commerce Department was asked to investigate me for practicing reverse discrimination. Because even though we'd only gotten up to about 35% of the hires being people of color, uh, there were some white male applicants who were upset that they were not hired. Um, so so that I was able to do things like that. Um, I was also able to push the envelope. The best thing about being the commissioner of trademarks was, was also that in the Patent and Trademark Office, most of Congress and everybody else concentrates on the patent side of things. Patents is an 800 pound gorilla, which meant on trademarks, we were able to experiment and, 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 and try some things, pilot some programs that maybe we wouldn't, that would have taken a lot longer to do on the patent side because you had to get buy-in. For example, the Trademark Office is one of the first if not the first government agency where people had to submit some sort of applications that started taking applications electronically. We started that in the mid 1990s. Um, and, you know, the, the now, and, I, and the thing was when we started doing this, I said, I wanted it to be a foolproof system. So when I left the trademark office, I wouldn't look dumb by not being able to file the applications electronically. So that's why I think most people believe that the trademark application process is very easy. And you really, you know, you don't need a lawyer to file it, but most of the time, individuals who don't understand trademark law have to hire a lawyer to deal with the office action. So we were able to do that. The other thing that the trademark office took the lead on was one of the first agencies to have work at home. Now that one, I take all the credit, but it was really one of my managing attorneys because I was I thought it was a crazy idea when I first heard about it. I thought it was a crazy idea. And I had a um, woman who later became the commissioner of trademarks, uh, Debbie Cohn. She was a managing attorney at the time and she kept beating me up. And I finally did, basically to get, get rid of her, said, okay, we can try this pilot. 
you can have, I think it was seven attorneys or eight attorneys work at home three days a week. That's how we started it. And and all and lo and behold, there were no problems with it. So now I think upwards of 80 to 90 percent of all trademark examining attorneys work from home. So we were able to successfully do that. And, um, and we also did a trademark assistance center, which is still in existence, which really has won kudos from a lot of customers of the trademark office. So I was able to do a lot of creative things. And I also was able to change the, um, the GS grades of a lot of the non-attorney staff. Mm -hmm. because. 95% of the non-attorney staff was African-American and they were stuck in low graded positions. I said, this isn't right. These people are pretty smart. So after a year and a half of struggle, I was able to create career ladders. And now most of the senior um, paralegals and uh, manage and non-lawyer managers in the organization are, were, a lot of them were there when I got there and they're now have gone up substantially in, in, in terms of government grades. In fact, the, I think she may even be an SES employee now. The woman who ran, ran the entire trademark operations now was a clerk when I got to the PTO. Wow. So we were able to do some good things in that way. Can't quite do that as much in, in big law because in big law, you got too, you got too many you know, chefs. Uh, you know, you too many cooks trying trying to add their own little element into into in, into the pie, right? And it doesn't work so well. Um, but you you can do certain things. Again, I think is you know perseverance is something that you need in big law, and e even to do uh, some small things. I mean, you have to understand that. It is easier for those in power in law firms to say no to anything you come up with, but you have to be ready and willing to to push back against that no and have data on your side. The one good thing about law firms is most of them are data driven. If you can come up with with data, good data, you can probably get things done. Um, I actually have enjoyed my years in big law. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I, I, I take, I mean, it, on one level, the environment is good and that you are around a lot of smart people. And so therefore you, you have to extend yourself to stay near the top of the pack, which is always a good, which I've always felt is a good thing, right? To be challenged, to be, you know, intellectually challenged. So, so I've had a uh, big fun on that. Um, you know, I've also, because of my personality, I've been able to do certain things in both law firms and um, in legal related organizations. You know, I was, you know, I had my firm support when I was, uh, became a member of the board of directors of the American Intellectual Property Law Association. I was also able to uh, become a, a uh, involved with what used to be called the American Intellectual Property Law Education Foundation. I think the new name is the Foundation for the Advancement of Diversity in Intellectual Property Law. Um, but I was able to work with that organization a fair amount for four or five years. I was chair of the uh, scholarship committee. And then for four years, I was, I was president of the organization. And the purpose of this organization, which is still in existence, except under that new, different name now, is to increase diversity in IP. And while I was while I was on in charge of the scholarship committee, chairman of the scholarship committee, I made sure that people didn't think that IP was strictly patents. I mean, occasionally, you know, some of the patent guys think that, you know, oh, anybody can do trademarks, so it's not really hard IP. So let's let's focus on patents. But there, there is actually a lack of diversity within the trademark area and particularly within copyrights. Um, so we're still, this organization is still pushing to diversify, you know, the three uh, major areas of IP law, patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Um, so I, I, I was able to participate in that. Then in my law firm, I was the, um, for four years, 
I was the office managing partner of the DC office of my former firm. And now that I switch firms, as you know, I am the chief diversity and inclusion officer. Uh, the only thing I'll say about that is sometimes you should be careful what you wish for, because sometimes that, 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 that dream job has a little bit more involved with it than you think. And, you know, the situation with Postinelli is it's 21 offices and 900 lawyers and seven different legal departments and 22 practice groups. And trying to get your arms around all that um, just generally is, is an issue. And then to have the diversity, uh, equity and inclusion overlay on that. But I'm beginning to make some progress and I hope to make some more progress in terms of you know, the big issue is making sure that women and racial minorities are given the training and the mentorship that they need to have a successful career. Hopefully that successful career means staying with us long enough so that they become a partner in the firm. But even if it doesn't mean that, because people leave law firms for all sorts of reasons. I mean, every, everything from somebody offers you a job you just can't say no to, to a family emergency in another state or something like that. So there are reasons why people leave. But my goal is to have every person leave, particularly women and minorities who leave the firm to have good feelings about us and become a, a source of uh, a, a, a future reference source for us. But people will only do that if they feel like you have done something very positive for their career. So to me, that's what the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the other thing is, and, and, and where I'm a, I know I'm going to get more pushback, is I want to take the non-equity partners and make them and, and have a pathway so they become full equity partners. Because you really don't have any juice in a law firm until and unless you're a full equity partner. And I believe, I believe it's true that, you know, if you look around a firm and don't see anyone in a, in a, in a senior position that looks like you, you, you may believe that there's a glass ceiling. And again, you may say like, why am I going to fight it here where I can, where I can at least see the possibility somewhere else. So I want to make sure that we don't lose folks for that reason either. We want people to feel like there, there is a pathway to, uh, possible at the firm. Now, again, you'll have to work hard and be a good lawyer. And I think that's the biggest thing at, at um, law firm is you have to become a true uh, practitioner of your craft. You have to become you know, a recognized leader or a recognized expert in some aspect. As a young associate, you don't have to become the recognized aspect in all areas of the law. You know, you, you know, you might get on that first case and there's an issue that really intrigues you and you keep pressing at it and pounding it. And sooner or later, people will start to notice and will come back to you. I mean, there was a um, black woman at the, the firm I went to straight out of the patent and trademark office when I went back into private practice and you know, we, you know I, I kept telling Lisa she needs to become an expert in something. She took uh, advice to heart and she suddenly became one of the leading experts in, in um, IP privacy law back when it was in an infant, uh, infant state. And now I see, I see Lisa Thomas's name on a lot of stuff. I'm like, hmm, that's the same Lisa that at first that I was a little crazy when I suggested that she do that. But you have to be, you have to become, I mean, there are a lot of smart lawyers out here. So you have to be, you have to give people a reason to come back to you and put you on that pedestal. Because just being smart, just being, just being smart is not enough. I mean, to become, a, 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 you have to either have the world's greatest personality that you just attract clients, you know, every day or you have to be the smartest person in the room. You can have no personality, but if you're the smartest person in the room, you will still get clients. Because at the end of the day, people want to win. It's, it, it feel, it's better if you win and you have a, 
a uh, lawyer that has a quote bedside manner end quote but you want to win and lawyers do we do keep track of w's and l's we do keep track of w's and l's yeah <laughs> Um, you mentioned a lot of challenges with being Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, but um, what are some of your favorite parts about the position? Well, the favorite part about the position is it gives me a reason to get to know, you know, all the people of color, regardless if they're in the IP or not. Um, I mean, I'm very happy with our IP group at Polsonelli. I mean, I've never been at a place that had five African American uh, partners in intellectual property. Uh, I, unfortunately, um, none of them is a woman. Is a woman, but hopefully next year we will make a an African American woman will become a partner at Polsonelli's IP group. But generally speaking, at big firms, if you're an IP, you don't know what the labor lawyers are doing. You barely know who they are. This way, I get to meet, uh, you know, and I get to meet all the new lawyers when they join the firm. So I, I get to, so now I know a lot more of, of, of the lawyers of color here at the firm. It also means that you get to know all the management of the firm in a different way. Also, you know, I now know who is the head of the labor group. I mean, there would be almost no reason for me to even have that knowledge before I had this position. So there are a lot of positives about it. And it's also, the other positive is I believe it will allow me to allow the firm to improve in this area. And that is, you know, what I'm dedicating the, 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 this end of my career to is to make more opportunities available to women and people of color in big law, not just in IP, but in big law. Because, you know, the, like I said, I don't want anyone to go, to have the same feelings of being left out and left behind that I had. I want no one to feel like the only way they can even understand what's going on at the firm is to, like I did, I found out more about my first firm by joining a bowling league with a couple of guys at the firm and drinking beer. And they, they would be telling me things that they thought I knew, but no one had, had told me. And that shouldn't be the way that you get mentored at a law firm. So I, I'm trying hard to, to, you know, get Polsonelli to a place where it's recognized and people will start trying to do the same things that we're doing here. To just, and, and I, you know, one of the th other things I've had fun doing is, you know, more and more clients are looking at diversity and inclusion as one of the metrics they use to hire law firms. And I've been on the call now, you know, I've only been in this position 10 months, 10 weeks rather, and I've already had calls with six or seven of the firm's major clients uh, about what are we doing with diversity inclusion, how are we doing things, et cetera. And it uh, also though allows me to push back a little bit against them. It's like, you know, you want us to do all this, why don't you help us out? And I've started to develop a whole uh, myriad of things that they can do. Things from as simple as, you know, volunteer to come to our diverse attorneys retreat that I'm putting together for the end of uh, summer for early fall, as soon as we can comfortably go back and see each other in person. Or maybe, you know, they, they, they can put together a, a virtual in, in the future live of events for their minority um, lawyers and our minority lawyers just so people get to, get to truly know each other. And even if it's, and even our minority lawyers who aren't working for that client, and even the, the, their minority lawyers that aren't working with the firm yet, because there can be relationships formed. And I'll, I'll be honest, it, it will help the firm out because the more contacts the firm has in the corporation, the more likely we are to get more business from that corporation. Because at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that keeps holding back, I think, some of the diversity and inclusion efforts in a lot of places is people think that it's a cost thing. So I'm putting together data and metrics to show that if you do diversity, equity, and inclusion correctly, it can, it can actually be a profit center. It can create profit. Because first thing, if folks don't leave, it, leave after a year or two because we're doing things wrong, 
we don't have we don't have to go out and hire people every every two years. So associate churn that would that could that could save the firm million dollars over a couple of years. Just just on that. Because the other thing is remember, if it, you know the first three months, I hate to t tell you uh, you folks this, but the first three months you aren't making the firm any money. You're learning your way around, you're learning how to do things, et cetera. And once you decide to leave, the last three months you're not going to do much either. So if we can extend out the period of time where you're actually making us some money, that's a good that's a good proposition for the for the firm. But it also means that maybe we're helping your career out more. So even if you do leave, you might send some business back. So we have to make sure that you know people should do diversity and inclusion because it's the right thing to do. But you know, you know, most lawyers are into it at least for a major part of it, particularly in law firms for the for the dollars. So if you can show them that they'll they will make and keep more dollars by doing the right thing, all of a sudden you have people who want to do the right thing. Yeah. So that, that's that's the fun part of my job now. And I know a lot of people, um, like myself included, when we're interviewing with firms, we ask, like, what are you doing for diversity and inclusion efforts? Because coming from Howard, that's something that's like really important to us um, as new um, hires. And so I think that's important to also highlight why I'm the firm and it's really important to institute these initiatives. Um, and kind of switching gears um, to some more light questions. Um, if you could have lunch with any well-known lawyer, alive or dead, who would it be and why? Actually, there are two people. One would be uh, Tom Williamson, who passed away a couple of years ago. Tom was an amazing uh, lawyer, African-American. He was a he was a, an all Ivy football player who actually got drafted in the NFL, but he decided to, do, I think, do a Rhodes Scholarship instead and went to UCAL Berkeley Law School. Tom became a partner at Covington and Burling when there were no black partners, hardly anywhere at any place. And Tom stayed a partner at Covington and Burling his entire career, except when he did some government service, including being the solicitor which actually is the general counsel of the US Department of Labor under the Clinton administration. I mean, Tom probably mentored more African-American lawyers in the DC, in Washington, DC than anybody else. And just to really understand his, his drive and passion would be just great to, and probably lunch wouldn't be long enough. I need, you know, a whole weekend full of meals and everything else. Uh, but he was he was really a, a great guy and and he was actually kind of shy which was the interesting thing about it because he late in his career he ran for and got elected president of dc bar but i had had to almost push him out i was at a couple receptions where i was dragging him by the hand to meet people so that they would know that he was tom williamson and this is who they needed to vote for right and i just thought that was always a little bit strange that he was a little he was actually a somewhat shy guy, but he was able to become the first black partner at Covington and one of the first black partners at a law firm in Washington, DC. And he, he's just a great guy. The other one is in the IP area. It's who I say is my mentor. He kept me sane. He probably he, he probably helped keep me or 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 not so much keep me, but he he was the one who kept saying, got to keep going on, Phil. You got to keep going on, Phil. And that's Sidney B. Williams, who the scholarships at that foundation I talked about earlier are named for. Sid was, he's just an amazing guy. He was the first African-American quarterback in the Big Ten. He also, you know, he became a patent examiner. He had a chemical engineering degree from the University of Wisconsin, became a patent examiner while he was going to law school. And for 29 years, he was um, a patent attorney for Upjohn and he rose to the ranks of the number two person in the patent department. He was also the first African-American to become an officer and a committee member in the IP section of the ABA and with the American Intellectual Property Law Association. 
And I met, I don't, I can't, I met Sid at a National Bar Association convention. He always showed up at the NBA back when we had maybe eight people in the section because there were so few African-Americans and Sid would motivate us all to stay with it, hang in there. And he was always available to take our calls. And he actually served on, you know, it was great to have Sid on the scholarship committee of, a, of you know, to help grant scholarships in his name. He had a unique perspective on, on you know, what it took to get through the, the you know, through, uh, I mean, Up John was basically a big law and he was just a great uh, person to, to talk to. And, you know, he's a little bit older now, else not great, but whenever I can catch up with Sid, I do because he's, he's, he's a great guy. So a couple of questions I'm hearing during um, And so just to leave off with our uh, last couple of questions, what advice for law students interested in a career in IP, uh, what advice would you give them? And also similarly, what advice would you give um, either um, entry level attorneys or attorneys even later in their career um, in the field of IP? Well, well, you know, folks trying to get into IP, Sometimes it takes a little bit of work, a little bit of perseverance, uh, particularly in the trademark area, because a lot of people now want trademark attorneys who, who have experience. And how do you get experience? So you, so we, we, um, so you have to have perseverance. I know there are a couple people from Howard Law School who, who their first job may not have even been a job that had the word attorney in it. Like it might have been a, a brand manager or, or, or something like that. But what does a brand manager do? What are, what, are, what are they playing with all day? It's trademark. And then they became a trademark attorney and, you know, that sort of thing. So, so keep your eyes open. Don't be, so, much, don't be so, so hung up your first few years as to what your title is. What you want to do is get some experience. Now, and on the patent side, it's a little bit easy, you know, it's, if you have the technical background and you can sit for the patent bar, you're at least within the ballpark of, of a lot of these firms. And you, you, you know, so, but the other thing you need to do is just connect with people in the IP field. Um, you know, you got great people at Howard, I mean, you know, and you, get, and you got convincing people at Howard because the only reason why I teach at Howard now is because of Latif and Tima. He kept bugging me like, Phil, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. So after a while, you know how Latif is, you know, you say yes, just so, he, just so he'll chill out. But seriously, he, uh, uh, Professor and Tima knows a lot of people in the field. He's very respected in the field. So, you know, press him a little bit, and, you know, have, have, have him open up his Rolodex a little bit. You know, he's a little bit tight with the Rolodex sometimes. Have him open up the Rolodex sometimes. And also check out, you know, check out the, um, found, the Foundation for the Advancement of Diversity and Intellectual Property Law. Check out the sections in, in the ABA or the AIPLA, the, the Young Lawyers or the Law Student Groups. I mean, they are, I mean, like in AIPLA, um, you know, now that I'm an older person, I'm, uh, they, they put all the old people in AIPLA in what they call the fellows. And one of the fellows, and we're supposed to do good things for the organization. And one of the projects of the fellows is to mentor uh, law students and, and young attorneys. So again, get in touch with folks. And, and remember, it's good to have some people of color as mentors, but it's good to have some other folks as mentors too, right? There, there. You know, you need you need a variety of mentors because everybody does it a little bit differently in IP, and you need to get a, a feel as you need to know you need to be able to find yourself, and the only way you can find yourself is to have you know varying mentors, right? I mean, um, you know, even if you're not thinking about going in a law firm, it might be good to have a, a mentor who's who's in a law firm because. They have a different understanding and idea of IP law, of trademark law. So I think that that's important. The big thing is, you know, network. And, and again, it's usually easier for trademark people to network than patent people because 
most of us patent guys, we, 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 we're, we're not that sociable. Like I said, you know, while everybody else was playing with each other in college, engineers were playing with machines. Enough said. So, you know, but definitely network and, and get to know people and, and don't be bashful, you know, just asking for, for help. Most people are very flattered when they're asked to help. They really are. I mean, they may not act like it, but, you know, to think someone thinks enough of me to ask me, that, that gives people a rush, right? It does. So don't be bashful with that. And the same thing goes for, you know, lawyers, you know, you know, after two or three years in the profession, again, continue to reach out uh, to people. But the other thing young lawyers need to do is let people you went to law school or you go to church with or your sorority sisters or whatever, know what you're doing. Because one of the things you have to slowly and subtly start doing is building a book of business, building relationships. And that's very important. And we, you know, because, you know, the more relationships that you have, the, that, that shows another dimension of being a lawyer. You have to be able to convince people to do things as a lawyer. And, and sometimes you, you, get, you get clients in the strangest ways. And, you know, and I've gotten, and it also for IP, sometimes, you know, friends and family can often become at least, you know, small clients or pro bono clients, because think every, every entrepreneur needs a trademark. You know, a lot of people cannot believe that as, a, as a, someone who grew up as a patent guy first, that I will say that trademarks are more important to small businesses because a small business, they might not be able to wait five years for this patent to issue. But if they have a good logo and a, and, and a, and a good trademark that's memorable and gets people back into their establishment, that means more business, more repeat business, and they're growing their business that way. So, you know, you know, let, let people know what you're doing. I'm, I mean, um, and, it, and if you see something that's, that's strange, I mean, mention it. I mean, I, I actually am the trademark counsel, IP counsel for my fraternity, Cap Alpha Psi. I only got that because I was reading in one of our publications that they couldn't get a trademark through it. And I said, I, I called up the general counsel at that point and said, I, I might be able to help us out a little bit. I know a little bit about trademarks. This was right after I got out of the PTO. And, you know, so again, just let people know what you're doing and, and be willing, especially your first three, two or three years out in practice, uh, volunteer your, 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 your knowledge. I mean, nobody expects you to have a $5 million client as a second year associate, but you might volunteer your knowledge to somebody at church who's starting something up. And, you know, and like I said, you should, you should be involved in your community in some way as, as a lawyer anyway, but you should only get involved in stuff that you, you really are passionate about. And often it's easier with something you're already doing like church, like a sorority, it, you know, if you've been involved in bar stuff, continue, stay involved in the bar, bar things. I mean, because that, that's the best way to, to really um, start uh, developing your career. That was really incredible. And thank you so much for sharing all of your perspectives and all of your experience with us today. We really appreciate it. Well, well, I want to thank you for asking me because, again, it's a rush to be asked. I'll admit that. But more importantly, I want to make sure that, that uh, folks at Howard uh, know that I exist and know that there are resources out here because I take it as a, an honor to teach at Howard University Law School. I mean, it is, it is the Mecca. I know other, uh, other Black folks are saying that their school is the Mecca. But I grew up in D.C. My mother wouldn't let me go to Howard because she said you, she, she didn't want me around. She didn't want me around. But Howard is the Mecca. So whatever I can do to help uh, Howard students or Howard grads, uh, please feel free to give me a call. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Take care.